his illustrations, his models, his artwork are incredible. Nothing compared to the depth of his knowledge. If it's if it's flown through the air and was military, he will be able to give you a history of it. So it's my honor and pleasure to welcome Michael Schratt. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for giving me the opportunity to join all of you today. And uh, I want to start by thanking Aurelio Maraca for giving me the opportunity to join you, join you today. And this could not have happened without your help. I also want to acknowledge Linda Zimmerman, who's done a fantastic job of cataloging not only the early sightings, but the sightings between 82 and 89 as well. Linda, thank you. You're a true crusader. Dennis Sant, would you please stand up and be acknowledged? Dennis Sant is with us tonight. He's in the house. He is one of the key primary eyewitnesses. His wife is with too. And uh, I want to thank them as, as well. But when we're talking about the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings, we're talking about probably the most significant UFO sightings in the United States, period, without question. And uh, you can also think about that we're looking at only 10% of people who report sightings actually ever get reported in the mainstream media. And I want to begin by starting with the fact that when uh, the Hudson Valley boomerang case really started December 31st, 1982, in Kent, New York, this is Night Siege, page six. And as we go through this, I want to give you a, an honest assessment that is non-biased and neutral, so you get a fair assessment of what we're actually talking about here. Now this is his, uh, basically his testimony, New York City police officer. Uh, the thing was a boomerang or V-shape. I could hear a faint, deep hum. It sounded like a factory with a lot of machines operating in the distance. Now this is a motif or description that we'll hear as we go through this presentation. Uh, characteristics of the Hudson Valley Boomerang, as we mentioned, 25,000 eyewitnesses between 1982 and 1989. Many of the eyewitnesses reported a tubes, pipes, and cylinders on the bottom of the craft. They also reported a low-frequency electrical humming noise like a transformer or a sewing machine. Many eyewitnesses described seeing panels on the bottom of the craft, which we'll show right here, that were basically a translucent or transparent panel where some of the eyewitnesses with, that were directly below the vehicle could see up inside the structure and they described what looked like cross beam and girder construction like a truss bridge directly from eyewitness reports. Hudson Valley boomerang characteristics. Sightings of the craft came in from Connecticut, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. The craft was virtually silent and measured between 300 and 900 feet across. The UFO was seen hovering over busy expressways, lakes, and rivers. The object was reported by airline pilots, air traffic controllers, doctors, lawyers, local law enforcement, firemen, and computer programmers. So just to get a cross-section of society of people who saw this, a complete spectrum of eyewitnesses. The craft appeared to have an industrial steel structural girder and cross-beam internal construction like a truss bridge. Now, I want to highlight the testimony of Monique O'Driscoll. She was driving down a road near Kent after having dinner with her family. Somewhere around 9 p.m., her daughter Monique was with her, and they saw this white light on a hill thinking, wow, what could this be? They knew that there was no house there, so they followed this light to a uh, uh, white pond area, and she, basically she was looking out her front windshield and this boomerang-shaped craft comes flying right over her uh, car. Monique was now uh, out of the car looking at this at the shoreline. And this thing did a 180 turn, came looking back at her, and then parked itself, hovered over White Pond, which was frozen at the time, and started blinking these multicolored flashing lights. And she could see the reflection on the frozen lake below. But what's interesting to note is these lights did not flash haphazardly. They flashed in sequence, so the reds would go off, the blues would go off, the greens would go off, the yellows would go off, in sequence, up and down the length of the boomerang. Now this is her report here from Philadelphia Inquirer, September 28th, 1984. And she says, I could see the underbelly part. It's solid. It had metal type work like cross beams and tubular things hanging down here and there. I was so close, I could have thrown a ball and hit it from Monique O'Driscoll. 
February 26, 1983, this is what it looked like as it passed overhead. And you can see we've included some of the cross beam and girder construction and what looked like pipes coming down and vents from the bottom of the craft. So if I go to my bag of tricks here, what you'll see on this Monico Drift Driscoll craft is this is something that we've seen over and over again. As the craft passed over, it parked itself over the white pond area and then hovered there and then made like a 180 degree flat turn. And this is something that we've seen uh, January 5th, 2000 Southern Illinois Triangle case, Hudson Valley Boomerang case. But the important point to keep in mind is that when these boomerangs turned, they didn't bank like a B-2 bomber would, right? They did this flat turn like on a record player. And that's something that we'll be discussing as well. <clears throat> here you can see uh, the internal structure here of what this craft could have looked like as it flew overhead. And here's Monique looking out on the, on the flat uh, section of the frozen pond as this thing did a 180. Now her daughter was in the car operating the uh, CB radio, which had static. So I question how Cessna 152s could hover silently, could make a 180 degree flat turn, and then cause static on a radio. Anyone will tell you, any pilots will tell you, hovering or even getting close to stall speed at that altitude is a death wish. Because if you stall at, say, 100 feet altitude, the, the wings are going to lose lift, the nose will drop straight down, It'll go right to the ground, that'll push the engine into the crew compartment, crushing the pilot, then the wings will break off, the wet wings full of fuel will explode, it'll be a huge fireball. But that's not what we see with the eyewitnesses, a flat 180 degree turn. Here you can see the lights beginning to uh, go up and down the forward section of the wing. Here's the green yellow lights. And now this is what we're looking at here when we see the reflection on the pond. So this is another key primary, primary eyewitness, Monique O'Driscoll. Now this is the section here where we have a, a white light in the center. This is also seen on November, uh, January 5th, 2000. And also what I'm proposing here is we could be looking at possibly is a liquid nitrogen cooling type apparatus. That's just one possibility which has been reported as well. Now I've, I've uh, went ahead and designed a blueprint and everyone here can certainly have a copy. You can have the kids build this and so you can have your own Monique O'Driscoll <laughs> Hudson Valley boomerang that's based off an actual case sighting. So it's not science fiction fantasy. We have actual documentation to back this up. And I built a smaller one because the first rule in government spending is why build one when you can build two at twice the price. So that's the, the concept behind government spending. Now. <clears throat> As we mentioned before, a lot of the eyewitnesses that saw the Hudson Valley boomerang stated that it rotated silently 180 degrees, but then they said that there was this mechanical understructure of the vehicle. That's the same mechanical understructure that was also seen in the 1989-1990 Belgium Triangle Raid. So, and I've got about 12 separate cases of the same similar understructure where it looked like the bottom of a muffler plant or something that was had silencers or pipes on the bottom. Question is, what are these for? What are these actually for? We have Dennis Sant, as we mentioned, in the audience with us. He's another key primary eyewitness in the Hudson Valley Boomerang case. His object was seen March 17, 1983, which was a Thursday. That will be very important as we go along. Why do we hear about craft being tested on Thursdays? We're going to get into that for sure. But briefly, uh, Dennis was returning home around 8.40 p.m. Uh, this is in Brewster, New York. And they saw a series of white lights over their house. And I hope I do justice to his case. And uh, as they got closer to the house, they lost sight of this, uh, perhaps a craft at that time. Didn't think too much about it. Went inside, were getting prepared to uh, retire for, for bed and taking off their coats. And then Dennis had this very interesting feeling in his stomach. And so he went back off uh, outside and saw just a stone's throw away over I-84, the bridge section there, a large boomerang L-shaped craft that was hovering silently. There were dozens of people who pulled off to the side of the road and were looking up at this craft. Not soon after that, this craft lowered in altitude from about 200 feet down to 160 feet and hovered and parked itself over a, 
uh, electrical light telephone pole that was about 50 to 60 feet tall. This craft was about 20 feet above that, so you can see the altitude. Then this craft hovered over his house. He eventually jogged and caught up to this craft, so he was directly below it. And then he saw what looked like bright, powerful beams shining down on the ground. This craft was silent. There might have been a hint of an electrical hum, but that's basically what we have here in Dennis Sand Siding. And you can see, as it hovered, I could make out dark, smoky, colored, metallic beams underneath. Huge, huge beams. This is Philadelphia Inquirer, September 28, 1984. March 24, 1983, Taconic State Parkway was a Thursday night. We keep hearing this over and over again, a Thursday night. Why Thursdays? Because if this was a man-made craft, Test flights of man-made classified vehicles always take place on Thursdays because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is pre-flight. Thursday's the test flight, Friday's debrief, Saturday, Sunday, there's no one at the base. So that's why Thursdays may play a role. And this is an illustration that was created which shows you the internal components or the cross beam and girder construction like a truss bridge that was stated by the eyewitnesses. Now, the Taconic State Parkway is so significant in the Hudson Valley sightings that it's as iconic as the sightings themselves because this is exactly where this took place. Brewster, uh, Danbury area, over in Buchanan at the Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant. We're going to consider that as well. But the point is that Taconic State Parkway is just so significant within the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings. Now, as this thing was coming up, this is March 24th, 1983, starting at Millwood and then making its way north toward Yorktown Heights. It didn't just follow the Taconic State Parkway, and we'll go into our bag of tricks again. It was making this zigzag maneuver like it wanted to be seen. It was very bold. It was very arrogant as it flew along. And as it would zigzag across the Taconic State Parkway, it would make that same 180 degree flat turn like on a, like on a turntable or if someone took a pencil and stabbed it right through the vertical axis and rotated it between their index fingers. That's the kind of maneuver that this craft made. It wasn't maneuvering like a B-2 stealth bomber or a YB-49. It wasn't banking. It was making this flat turn like on a, a vertical axis. And that's what I want to highlight right here. Uh, this is what exactly the type of flight characteristics that this craft made. Just making this flat turn and all the lights and basically 100% of the eyewitness cases indicated that the lights remained equidistant and were rock solid like they were embedded in concrete. You just can't get that, ladies and gentlemen. Flying ultralights, you can't get that kind of uh, accuracy. The Blue Angels can't even get that level of accuracy. When you talk about lights embedded in concrete as it rotates, we're talking about something completely different here. Now, we'll move on to patent trader Mount Kisco, New York, March 25th, 1983. What was the brightly colored object reported in area skies Thursday? The object was seen from White Plains, New York, to as far north as Yorktown. One witness described seeing alternating colors between white and green as the object zigzagged across toward the north. More than a flight of fancy, reporter dispatched White Plains, New York, September 11th, 1983. And we'll consider just a couple of the highlights on this. Hundreds of witnesses from Westchester and Putnam saw the unknown craft. Between 8.30 uh, and 10.30 p.m., police switchboards were jammed with frantic calls from local residents. At the intersection of routes 202 and 35, traffic was halted in a tangled jam as motorists stopped, got out of their cars, and looked up at the object. Over the Taconic Parkway, motorists stopped in groups to observe the object hovering above the treetops. Witnesses reported a large, slow-moving, silent V-shaped uh, of, of multicolored lights that cruised in a looping pattern over Yorktown, Summers, Carmel for more than an hour. Hundreds claim to see UFO, and this is an interesting case. Uh, number one, a truck driver heading north uh, down Interstate 684 in Brewster had a particularly interesting sighting on March 17th of 1983. This is reported by uh, Sergeant Joseph Andrew from Air National Guard Detachment, Westchester County Airport. The truck driver was driving along when he saw a group of lights 10 or 15 feet off the ground 
right in front of him. He said when he stopped near the craft, he got static on his radio. Radio. Then the lights disappeared. The unknown object appeared to be the size of an aircraft hangar. And this was confirmed by Putnam County official Dennis Sand, who's with us today. So again, 10 to 15 feet off the ground is not an ultralight. It's not a plane hovering. This is something different, no question. Uh, you already saw the model here, and this is another one. I've, I've built the blueprints so you can have uh, your friends, or you can actually build your own Hudson Valley boomerang that hovered over the Taconic State Parkway. This is what it looks like when it's done. Now, the uh, reservoir, March 24th, 1983. This is night page, uh, night siege page 33. Just want to give credit to Philip Imbrogno for his very good original research. This is from David Scar Scarpino. As I watched, the lights started to turn very slowly, as if on a wheel. Now, we've heard that before. The object turned 180 degrees in a tight circle. I couldn't make out any structure, but from the way the lights moved, I was certain this was one solid object. Uh, this is Kent, New York, Night Siege, page 35, James Holson. The strange thing about it was the object made no sound. It just hung there motionless in the sky. Really good uh, testimony. This is the map of where he saw that. Brewster, New York, March 24, 1983. This is John Miller. These searchlights moved across the surface of the pond as if the object were looking for something. These lights were very bright. I stopped my car to watch. As I was watching the object sweep the beams of light across the water, I could hear a faint whooshing sound. So that's something we've heard, this electrical humming sound, or something that sounded like an, a, uh, a sewing machine, or kind of a, a machine shop operating in the background. That's what we were hearing on this. Uh, John Picone, he was a Grumman worker with an aerospace background, said it flew very smooth and the sound coming from it was very quiet. I should have heard much more sound than I did. I've been working around aircraft for a long time, and I don't know any aircraft engine that is quiet like that. He also went on to state, I work on spacecraft as well as aircraft. There is no doubt in my mind that what I saw was not aircraft, coming from a Grumman aerospace engineer. Uh, Andy Sadoff, Newcastle Police Department. This is March 24th, 1983. This is her testimony. It then hovered about 20 seconds, and I could see a mass that was very large behind it. Behind the lights, that is, I could see a large object. No, this could not have been ultralights. This was impossible. What I saw was one object very huge. So I'm presenting the case here that witness after witness is absolutely claiming that what they saw was a solid piece, one object, not planes flying in formation. Brer Cliff, New York, Night Siege, page 42. Elaine Kuchin, this is her testimony, very interesting. There were about 20 lights. The object hovered for a while, then streaked from one end of the sky to the other, then back again in a split second. It then hovered. It passed in front of the moon. I saw a massive superstructure that seemed to be enormous, six stories or more high, very heavy. It suddenly moved and disappeared. A six-story high superstructure. If you did do any research on superstructure, you're going to come up with this. You're going to come up with this cross beam and girder construction like a truss bridge. This is exactly what the <coughs> witnesses are reporting. No question. Questions fly over Putnam UFO, Danbury, Connecticut, New Times, April 5th, 1983. During the time period between March 24th of 19, to 26, 1983, more than 100 sighting reports came into police stations in Carmel, Brewster, Putnam Valley, Yorktown, and Mount Kisco. Other witnesses described seeing a large craft that hovered overhead, which projected a, a beam of light toward the ground. Number three, several callers who said they saw the object from their automobiles said it interfered with their radio reception as it passed overhead. So how do you get Cessna 172s flying in formation, causing radio disturbance, and then keep in mind, if you have these planes flying in formation, you have to watch the other planes for hazardous conditions like coming too close and ramming in and causing a mid-air collision. So if you're trying to fake this, you, your eyes can't be down at the ground. You have to be looking at the other planes so that you don't have a collision. But then it gets more complex because remember, we see these white lights shining down. You'd have to be outside the cockpit looking down, shining the light, and then trying to keep the other planes away from you 
head maybe six to ten inches away, it's not going to happen. There's no way it's not going to happen. Now, one of the interesting reports when we're talking about March 24th, 1983, and I'm trying to make a connection here, is only 24 hours uh, prior to the March 24th, 1983, President Ronald Reagan gave his address to the nation to basically pitch the SDR Star Wars program. Only 24 hours later, huge sighting over the Taconic State Parkway. So there may be a connection between SDI funding and what we're seeing in the Hudson Valley boomerang. Now, there are, I'm very well aware that there are two camps of people within these sightings. Number one, the object was a genuine UFO that could be extraterrestrial. Number two, the sightings could be explained by a group of, quote, stunt pilots based out of Stormville Airport, AKA the Stormville Flyers. Now, the subheading broken down below that includes ultralights or small engine planes, Cessna 152, Cessna 172. So those are the two branches of research within the Hudson Valley Boomerang, and people are kind of either on one side or the other. And I just want to say, is there a third option? And I want to present a fair and balanced assessment. Top 10 reasons why not all of the Hudson Valley Boomerang sightings can be explained by ultralights. And I want to drill really deep on this for sure, no question. Number one, Ultralights are prohibited from flying a half hour after sunset. Number two, ultralights make a significant amount of noise due to their two-cycle Rotax engines, even with mufflers or silencers. You're not going to get the level of quietness that they reported in the eyewitness reports. No pilots were ever arrested in connection with the Hudson Valley sightings. Number four, ultralights are prohibited from flying over nuclear power plants at night and 30 feet above reactor number three at Indian Point. Uh, number five, ultralights can't hover without a headwind. That's true. Number six, ultralights lack the necessary power source to explain the hundreds of multicolored flashing lights and powerful beams as reported by the eyewitnesses. Number seven, ultralights generally never fly in gusty wind conditions, peaking at 35 miles an hour. Number eight, flying ultralights in close formation at night without anti-collision lights would be far too dangerous even for the most experienced pilots. Number nine, according to the FAA, aircraft flying over populated areas are required to be no less than a thousand feet from any person or object. However, many eyewitness reports indicated that the craft flew at treetop level. Hundreds of witnesses, treetop level. Ultralights can't make flat stationary turns without banking. Now, if you're still not convinced that ultralights are not responsible. I went even further. I contacted a flight instructor, actually in Australia. He pointed me to the FAR Ames. This is 2016 Federal Aviation Regulations Aeronautical Information Manual. <coughs> and we're going to drill down on this. Subpart B, Operating Rules, 103.9, Hazardous Operations. This is within FARs here. No person may operate any ultralight vehicle in a manner that creates a hazard to other persons or property. So do you think if you were flying an ultralight over a populated area, six inches from another ultralight, that risk an, uh, a collision? Is that a threat? Absolutely. 103.11, daylight operations, right out of the handbook. No person may operate an ultra vehicle except between the hours of sunrise and sunset. B, notwithstanding paragraph A of this section, ultralight vehicles may be operated during the twilight periods 30 minutes before sunrise and 30 minutes after sunset. But a lot of the reports were 9.30 p.m., 10.30 p.m., way after sunset. 103.15, operations over congested areas. No person may operate an ultralight vehicle over any congested area of a city, town, or settlement or over any open air assembly of persons. Local UFOs called historical and interesting. Herald statements, Yonkers, New York, May 22, 1983. I want to give my sources here. The object was said to hover as low as 30 feet from the ground, make sudden right angle turns, and emit a low humming noise. One witness stated that if he climbed to the top of his roof, he could have hit it with a stick. Folks, I mean, it's clear. We're, we're not talking about ultralights here. Uh, some, but not all, sightings in Danbury, Connecticut were attributed to small single-engine Cessna 152 aircraft flying in formation. 
However, those who saw both the planes and the genuine Hudson Valley boomerang could immediately tell the difference. So bottom line is, those who saw the actual Hudson Valley UFO, who also saw the planes, said there's no comparison. We're talking about two different animals here, no doubt. Planes behind part of UFO sightings. This is reporter dispatch, White Plains, New York, July 15, 1983. Witnesses described seeing two planes over the Taconic Parkway, which was then joined by a third. Flying in formation, uh, a V formation, these pl planes mimic some of the traits reported by eyewitnesses, but they lack the imposing sight as seen by those who viewed the solid dark colored boomerang. When the planes departed the Taconic Parkway, they were seen heading in the direction of Stormville Airport. At least one parachutist and one small aircraft was reported to have landed. Mystery Craft Prop UFO reports Milford Citizen, March 22, 1985. Wendy Feinberg, Assistant News Director of Channel 8, said this morning that Channel 8 weatherman Geoff Smith had been told by a tower operator at Dutchess County uh, Airport in uh, Whippingers Falls, New York, that the three craft had been responsible for all of the excitement. Feinberg said that Smith had been told by a tower operator that the objects were actually three small planes, namely a Mooney, a Cessna, and a Tri-Pacer. So could these three planes cause what the eyewitnesses reported? The electrical humming, the uh, electromagnetic disturbances, the radio static, the 180 degree flat turns? <coughs> Don't think so, but planes absolutely were involved to a certain degree. Planes blamed for UFO sightings, Milton Press, March 22, 1985. The aircraft were apparently using all their lights while flying in close formation above 7,000 feet, according to Paul D. Estefan, administrator of the Danbury Municipal Airport. Estefan said that the use of bright white landing lights had probably caused the rash of sightings. And this is interesting here. Uh, that explanation did not satisfy two eyewitnesses. Vanessa Schmaltz and Bunny Orkomsky said they saw a low hovering object as they drove by Lake Bessick in Middlefield at 9.30 p.m. Schmaltz said that the object slightly above tree level resembled a giant upside down salad bowl. Oh, it was huge, she said. You could actually see a dome on the top with flashing lights going around the dome. Now, Afro Bulletin, just to be fair, just to give a fair assessment, May 1985, they did a, an interesting report here. It says, in issue number six, field investigator Dick Rule and his team of New York investigators described their stakeout of the Stormville New York airport and subsequent identification of the Stormville pilots who had been flying in the Westchester area and creating a sensation. Mr. Rule is convinced, as headquarter personnel are, that a very small fraction of the reported cases in New York in the last two years are unidentified and that a substantial number of the overall cases were actually misidentifications of Cessnas. Now that's true to a certain degree, but that doesn't hold true when you examine the eyewitness testimony as we've seen here. So absolutely no question, planes were involved in some of the sightings, but not all of the sightings. That's the point we're making. Now, here is the actual photograph from the April Bulletin, September 1984. Ladies and gentlemen, there's your Hudson Valley boomerang, right? That's it. But as you can see, the lights are absolutely not equidistant. Uh, they can't hover in formation. They can't do that 180 degree flat turn and keep all lights embedded in concrete. So point is, planes were involved, but planes don't explain all the Hudson Valley sightings. Now, this is the statements made within that April Bulletin. Patrolman Richard Stuza, while driving on Route 84 near Stormville Airport, claims to have seen a group of lights in a wedge-shaped formation. According to the officer, one by one, the lights broke formation, circled over Greenhaven Correctional Center, and then landed at Stormville Airport. Two, Captain Mary Bennett, who flew traffic reports for radio station WFAS, claims to have seen the planes both from the air and from the ground. He also claims to have witnessed many near car accidents as the planes flew overhead, startling drivers below. Captain Laporte of the Greenhaven Correctional Center stated that he saw the planes take off from Stormville Airport and form up their wedge boomerang shaped formation many times. He also stated that he saw the planes break formation and land. Four, Peter Gerson received a call 
which made the claim that pilots at the Stormville Airport were seen stringing extra lights on their aircraft. So we're, we're definitely seeing some evidence of planes flying in formation. According to that bulletin, six Cessna 172 Skyhawks were seen at night flying in formation over Stormville Airport. Officials from the Green Haven Correctional Facility claimed to have seen planes take off from Stormville Airport and join up forming a wedge or boomerang shaped formation. So I, I did a Google search of the map here and you can see Stormville Airport, which is now a flea market now, is directly within the flight line. If you took off here and you made a left bank to, to avoid this, you could see how people here in this area would be able to see these planes eventually join up. Virtually all of the Hudson Valley UFO sightings took place on clear, cloudless nights. Was this because the Stormville Flyers didn't want to be silhouetted against a bright background? That's interesting. Why would it be on a cloudless night? You would think, well, maybe they would fly at any time, but they only picked those nights. Did, did they not want to be exposed? That's the question. So in that report, in that April report, they actually identified a tail number within that report. So I tracked down that tail number. It is November 76106, and anyone here can do this. You can go on FAA.gov, and you can track that tail number. That particular tail number, as of right now, belongs to a Cessna 140 tail dragger. There does exist the possibility that that tail number was reassigned from a 172 back around 83, 84 time. But as it stands right now, according to FAA.gov, this could have been one of the aircraft associated with the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings. Now this isn't the exact aircraft because I couldn't find a photo of that aircraft, but this is the exact same type Cessna 140 according to the tail number. Uh, Danbury, Connecticut, Bill Pollen, Night Siege, page 47. I saw five planes flying together in formation around this field. They were trying to pull a hoax. I stopped at the rest area, got out of my car, and sat at a picnic bench to watch them. They would all turn their lights on at one once from red to white. Those were the only lights they had. They were flying all around this valley. The first object I saw definitely wasn't a plane. Hudson Valley boomerang eyewitness. It was so big, it filled up the whole sky and it was very solid. It blocked out the stars and clouds that were very visible that night because it was a very clear night. I watched it for about 30 to 45 seconds in awe, wondering what it could possibly be. It was absolutely silent. Then I ran down into the street. By that time, whatever it was moved away in a straight course. The lights were always equidistant. They never moved or wavered, and it assumed the shape of a boomerang. So I went ahead and did a technical drawing of planes flying in formation at straight level. Now this is something that you could do, right? This is something that's certainly doable. But, you know, due to human error and atmospheric disturbances, you're always going to get a little bit of wavering on these outside pilots, right? There's always going to be like a foot or two on either side. You won't get that rock solid steadiness. But it gets worse. As the planes flying in formation, now this would be the lead pilot, right? We're, and we're trying to pull a hoax here, according to uh, what they're stating here. The lead pilot's making the left turn. That means, according to the laws of physics, the, the pilots on the left have to slow down. They have to throttle back, right? But since the guys on the outside are on the outside of the arc, they're making a longer distance turn. They have to speed up. And so it gets more and more difficult to have this rock steady formation. And remember, this guy has to be looking out at all of these guys so that they don't collide with each other. And yet he's staring down, shining a spotlight down on the on the people in the Taconic State Department. You can see this thing just keeps converging and you can see that this is just not gonna happen. Now, it gets even worse because when you do a 180 degree flat turn like was seen on the Hudson Valley Boomerang, March 23rd, 1983, here's where it gets really worse. Pilots on the right side of the V formation have to go ahead and to the left, right? Pilots on the left side of the formation have to go back and to the left. What happens, any pilots? What happens when you have an aircraft wing and you go backwards? It stalls immediately. The air separates from the top surface of the wing and you'll stall the wing. It'll fall right out of formation. So we can definitively state that what was seen over at Taconic State Parkway making this rock solid 180 flat turn was not a group of ultralights, was not a group of planes. No question. 
We're looking at something much more representative of this, a solid piece where the lights moved all together in unison and were equidistant. This is closer to what we're looking at. Now, you could almost call this Discover article, this is Discover Magazine, November 1984, you could almost call it a hit piece because they really tried to push this concept that people are only seeing planes. Uh, here's a couple of the quotes here. Loose groupings of planes became tight formations with as little as inches between wingtips. Wait a minute, inches between wingtips? Many of the Hudson Valley boomerang eyewitnesses said that this was between one football field and two football fields across. Yet they're talking about inches between wingtips? Uh-uh. I wouldn't fly in 35 knot winds a few inches from another plane? There's no way I would do it. I don't think you would either. It's just too risky. One resourceful state policeman spotted a UFO one night, chased it until it descended in the form of several small planes in the Stormville airport. Why the Discover article fails to address all of the sightings. Let's run through these quickly here. One, none of the Stormville flyers were ever caught or arrested. None of the Stormville flyers ever had their pilot's license revoked by the FAA. None of the Stormville pilots were ever identified by name. Number four, a complete list of aircraft tail numbers associated with the sightings were never compiled by the FAA. No pilots have ever come forward stating that they heard radio communications from the mysterious night flyers over the frequencies 122.8 and 122.9. The article never addressed the static or electromagnetic interference as heard by the multiple eyewitnesses. That's something that has never been explained. The article never explained how the mysterious planes could hover silently over treetop level. The article never properly addressed the issue of multicolored flashing lights as observed by the eyewitnesses. Number nine, the article addressed the, never addressed the issue of flat turns identified by the eyewitnesses. They went on here that they never addressed how the planes could shine a powerful spotlight down on the Taconic Parkway while still retaining a safe distance from the other aircraft flying in formation. That's the key to it right there, the flying in formation. Turning off navigation lights at night is a violation of FAA regulations. The mysterious pilots ran the risk of violating criminal nuisance ordinances or being sued by drivers who might have been frightened or distracted. The article never addressed the tubes, pipes, cylinders, beams, and mechanical structure on the bottom of the Hudson Valley boomerang as viewed by the eyewitnesses. The article never addressed the transparent panels, the translucent panels seen on the bottom of the UFO as witnessed by the multiple uh, reports. Eyewitnesses reported when the object passed by overhead, it blocked out the stars. So they never talked about these issues in this article. So they just want you to believe that what we're seeing is just planes. But when you look at even Linda Zimmerman's reports, who did, who did took it one step further, she took a ride in an ultralight, interviewed the pilots. When they were interviewed, and it's clear here, ultralight pilots who were based out of Stormville Airport in 1983 stated emphatically that their craft could never lift the necessary equipment needed to explain the tremendous luminosity displayed by the actual Hudson Valley boomerang. They just don't have the capability of lifting up that heavy equipment to shine those huge, powerful spotlights down. Now, we do have some reports, according to Philip Imbrogno, that there has been some CIA operation flying twin-engine O2 aircraft to muddy the waters. So you've got the Hudson Valley boomerang, you've got what people think might be ultralights, then you've got Cessna 152, 172 pilots flying in formation a month after the actual sightings. Then you've got these CIA-operated O2 Cessna aircraft flying also after the sightings. And when you mix all this together, you can see how the confusion can stem from all these different sightings. But again, we have to remember that the people who saw the original Hudson Valley UFO and then later saw the planes said that they were absolutely two different things. Flying Saucer Review, Volume 31, Number 3, 1986. More on boomerang, large as two football fields. Between March of 1983 and November of 1985, more than 80 articles reporting the Hudson Valley UFO appeared in local newspapers in the two states of New York and Connecticut. The important fact to note is these formations of aircraft had not been seen or reported until a month after the first reports of the UFO. 
Many of the witnesses who had seen the UFO had also seen the aircraft, and they agreed there is no confusing the two. It is estimated that over 30,000 individuals have seen a very large, low-flying, almost silent object displaying variable lighting, hovering, moving silently, suddenly accelerating, and generally behaving almost as if to attract attention to itself. And I want to also address this quote from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you may fool all the people some of the time. You can even fool some of the people all of the time. But you can't fool all of the people all of the time. So I want to state emphatically that you just can't fool us anymore, folks. You can't tell us that it's ultralights uh, regarded uh, even high-level government officials, FAA officials trying to explain this away as just, oh, it's just a bunch of ultralight pilots. You just can't fool us anymore. We've definitively shown that it's, it's not ultralights or all planes flying in formation. Uh, Hartford Current, this is August 16, 1984. UFOs amaze experts, chill state residents. On the night of July 20, uh, 12, 1984, a huge boomerang-shaped object the size of a football field was seen floating over Danbury, Connecticut, which had multicolored red, yellow, and blue lights. Some witnesses reported that objects shot spotlights onto the ground. This is, we've heard before as well. Here's a report, Bedford, New York, page 73, Night Siege, March 25th, 1984. This is the map on where this was seen by Michael Pizzaz. The thing that caught my attention was the sharp angle it made when it turned. All the lights turned at once, and it moved like one solid object. There was no way this could have been a group of individual objects flying in formation. Solid testimony. June 24th, 1984, Peak Skill, New York, page 88. This is from Norman Morsley. The object itself looked very thin, like a bridge. You could see right through the side of this thing. There was nothing there. There was like cross gutters across it. I saw structure on the top part and bottom, and in between was hollow. I could see right through it. The center was hollow. The only solid part was the top and bottom. Clearly, we're not talking about ultralights here, no question. Now, this is another interesting report. Gail DeFate. June 24th, 1984, very interesting testimony. There were tons of lights. My daughter, who was with me, at, and she was nine, described it as a huge Ferris wheel on its side. There was a regular airplane coming toward it, but these lights were so different. The airplane looked so tiny compared to what she saw, or we saw. And this is something that we've heard too, that the lighting configuration looked like a Ferris wheel tipped 90 degrees and then rotated on its axis, exactly what was seen over at Taconic State Parkway. Aerial police get reports of UFOs. New Times, Danbury, Connecticut, July 20th, 1984. Police departments in Carmel, Putnam County, Bethel, Brookfield, and New Fairfield received calls from residents stating that they saw a pattern of lights hovering in the sky between 10 and 11 p.m. Remember the FAI report indicating that you can't fly ultralights after sunset a half an hour? Here we've got 11 p.m., way beyond FAA regulations. Additional witnesses reported seeing a solid white mass with something trailing behind. That takes us to the July 24th, 1983. Actually, it's here. Uh, 1984 uh, Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant encounter. This is July 24th, 1984. And this was seen by 12 Nuclear Regulatory Committee uh, security guards that were basically standing below this craft at the Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant with their mouths dropped and had shotguns aimed at this thing. This has been basically confirmed by one of the security guards at the plant who was there. Uh, there was a gentleman inside one of the offshoot security buildings here that was recording this whole thing on videotape. So there does exist a videotape of this. But he said that this craft was so large that they had to pan the camera 180 degrees to get the whole thing in frame. That's how big this thing was. Approximately 900 feet across. It had a circular depression in the middle of the craft that he said was large enough to put Volkswagen Beetles in, hovering silently over reactor number three, which was the only reactor in operation that night, July 24th, 1984. Reporter dispatch, White Plains, New York, January 12th, 1985. UFOs, did aliens buzz Indian Point nuclear power plant? A couple of quick highlights. Shotguns were drawn by the security guards. National Guard were notified. 
New York Power Authority ref uh, refused to release the details. The object was 900 feet across, hovered over the plant for 15 minutes. <coughs> Winds on the night of the sighting were gusting to 24 miles an hour. That's basically too much for an ultralight at that low <coughs> altitude. A helicopter gunship was called in to investigate. Not only was it called in, but it shot on the aircraft as well as the security guards, and it had no effect according to the uh, guard who was interviewed. Carl Patrick, New York Power Authority spokesman, confirmed the sighting and knew the security guards and vouched for their credibility. A similar incident took place June 14, 1984. So something significant happened here at the Indian Point nuclear power plant. Uh, this is page 47, 147. No small planes could stay in formation with the wind that night. The wind didn't phase these lights at all. When it hovered, it just stood there. I was in the service and I flew helicopters, and I know how hard it is to keep a formation with small planes. I saw no hint of any standard lights that a plane would have. Also, the lights were much too intense for small aircraft. This is from one of the security guards himself. So even he's convinced it wasn't just planes flying in formation. Now, as we mentioned, Philip Imbrogno stated that he interviewed one of the security guards at the plant that night who stated that a helicopter gunship from Camp Smith was called onto the scene. They actually fired on the object, had no effect whatsoever. So if it was planes flying in formation, they would have either been shot down or the planes would have evacuated the area immediately. Here's some of the couple of terms that came up that describe how this thing flew. Uh, it was bold. It was presumptuous. It was arrogant. It was brazen. Webster's Dictionary, brazen, bold, and without shame. This Hudson Valley boomerang acted like it was too cool for school. It acted like, you know, it didn't care who was watching. It was going to go where it wanted, when it wanted. It was very bold. This is something that pilots trying to sneak around wouldn't do. Now, Bob Pozzoli also took videotape footage on the same night as the craft that hovered over the Indian Point nuclear reactor. So not only do we have the 12 security guards, we've got the New York Power Authority also confirming those, backing up the security guard. We have Bob Pizzoli who videotaped it the very same night it flew over the reactor. And then that videotape was sent to JPL, Dr. Al Hicks from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, examined the videotape. Now, when it was sent to JPL, they weren't interested in whether or not this thing was a, an extraterrestrial UFO. All they wanted to know, they were very neutral, they were non-biased. All they wanted to know was, that it, was this one piece of a solid object or were these multiple planes flying in formation. According to Jet Propulsion Laboratory, this was solid, one rigid object, according to JPL. Cigar with square windows. Bradley International Airport, January 9th, 1986. Page five is the source for this. This is Joanne Williams. Uh, she saw a cigar with square windows. This thing of it being f aircraft flying in formation is a load of crap. That's what she said. So, got to go by her testimony. <laughs> Times Union, Albany, New York, December 27th, 1987. UFOs buzzing Hudson Valley. You can see the cutaway of the map here, and I've blown that up directly from the Bob Pratt, J. Allen Hynek, Philip Imbrogno book, Night Siege. So you can see this entire area here. Danbury, Brewster, Buchanan, uh, we've got Mount Kisco, uh, Midwood down in here. The entire area here is what we're talking about. Westchester Boomerang, Westchester County. They had a huge flat of boomerang sightings. This is 83, 84, early time frame on these particular sightings. I want to draw your attention to this letter <clears throat> that was definitely from Stanton Friedman. I got a copy of the letter from QFOS and also from Tony Gonzalez. But this is was sent to Tony Gonzalez. This is from Stanton Friedman directly, January 17, 1990. Here he says, quote, I have always been bothered by the Westchester County sightings because I never heard of actions that would clearly label the technology alien. Quote, wings in outer space could only be decoration, but do, of course, match an earthling approach. So I ask all of you, I, I submit this to you, would an alien spacecraft need wings to fly in space? I mean, space is a vacuum, right? We're not talking about aerodynamic principles here. Why would you need wings? And I, I think Stanton is, is 
pretty much correct here. It could only be decoration. We're talking about something else here. We may be looking at something, a third option. Now, throughout this time frame, and this is a photograph of UFO lawyer Peter Gersten and Philip Imbrogno. They were placing these classified ads in the penny saver. Most of you might be familiar with this. And we'll just review a, a couple of these quick ads. This is penny saver classified ad. UFO last seen on 625. Real UFO is not planes or ultralights. Do not be misled. Real UFO can hover. These are directly from the ads. Move extremely slow or fast and is practically noiseless. It is huge. It is anywhere between 6 to 25 multicolored lights. If you see, call their number. Next one, UFO update. Major sightings Thursday, July 12th. There's that Thursday again. If you saw it, especially around I-84, please call. Urgent concern. Definitely not ultralights. Irresponsible and immature pilots attempting to mislead public, such as on night of July 19th. Real UFO performs beyond present-day technology. We're going to look at that. Under intelligent control, probably extraterrestrial. UFO update August 3rd. Hotline still receiving incredible reports from credible people of a large wingless object. We have video of planes and object, and there is a difference. The UFO controversy, is it planes? This is going to be a part of a presentation conference August 25th. This is back in 1984. Henry H. Middle School, Brewster, New York, August 25th, 1984. So the sightings started getting more and more intense. There was more public interest, and it crescendoed in this meeting at the H.G. Wells Middle School in Brewster, New York, where over a thousand people showed up and gave their testimony. Rash of UFO sightings draws crowd to Upstate Conference. Quick highlights. 12-hour meeting that was attended by more than a thousand people. Dr. J. Allen Hynek was present. Event was covered by members of the media. Goal was to, quote, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a strange, unusual objects do exist. Primary eyewitnesses were invited to give their testimony. A question and answer session was also included. Now, what major media was present? New York Times was there, Chicago Tribune was there, Hartford Courant was there, ABS News, CBS News, NBC News. So this is a worldwide major event, making the Hudson Valley Boomerang sightings probably the most significant up to that time. I want to bring your attention to Tony Gonzalez, who's no longer with us, but this guy was a genius, a mechanical genius. He served in the Navy on an aircraft carrier, very familiar with aircraft jet propulsion, how planes fly. He was the first person, credit has to go to him, he was the first person to travel around the country giving a lecture indicating that what people may have seen may have been a man-made craft that had these tubes, pipe cylinders, had these transparent panels, something that looked like the B-2 configuration before the wing redesign in 1983. So credit has to go. Now this is just his assessment, one possibility that might explain some of the Hudson Valley sightings. Now this is his scale model that was built. It has about a three foot wingspan. He had this thing as he was going around the country. It has little miniature fan engines on the inside and the whole thing is lit up electrically that has these bright spotlights coming down. He has multicolored lights just like what the eyewitnesses reported. He can also turn this thing on a 180 degree uh, spotlight vertical axis. He's also duplicated the ports on the bottom and these cross beam transparent panels, exactly what was seen by the Hudson Valley witnesses. And this is the point I want to make up because he may have been onto something. It may not be 100%. It may not be the definitive answer to the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings, but at least it's consistent with what Northrop was doing in the early 1980s. So if you look at the configuration in 1983, this is what they proposed for the B-2 stealth bomber. A boomerang shaped craft with a single triangle trailing edge. After 1983, at the cost of $1 billion to taxpayers, that wing was redesigned to the double W or sawtooth trailing edge that we see today at local air shows. So you can see the difference in the designs here. Roll change forced B-2 into $1 billion redesign. Flight International, July 11th, 1991. Here you can see the original B-2. This is the final configuration right here. 
Now, this is a desktop model directly from Northrop Grumman Corporation themselves. This is their actual desktop model, the original B2 configuration with a single triangle trailing edge, and then what we see today, the $2.3 billion B2 that you can see in an air show, which is, in the original configuration, almost a dead ringer to what the eyewitnesses reported in the Hudson Valley sightings. Times Union, Albany, New York, February 2nd, 1989, asked UFOs from the USA, is something being based at Stewart Air Force Base back in 83, 84? Just a question we need to raise. Now, B-2 roll-up, November 22nd, 1988. Now, if you think about that, November 10th of 1988 is when the U.S. Air Force acknowledged the existence of the F-117 stealth fighter. Just about a week and a half later, they pulled out the B-2 stealth bomber on November 22nd, 1988. But then we already showed before that the Westchester County sightings took place 83-84. This is well afterward. They rolled this out well afterward. So it can't just be the B-2 stealth bomber, right? Because this thing didn't even fly until July of 17, 1989. Also want to point out that $22.4 billion was spent on the B-2 stealth bomber when it rolled out November 22, 1988. They had already blown $22.4 billion. Could some of that funding been siphoned off to another project? Possible. When you're talking about $22.4 billion, What's 30 million? What's 40 million? It's, it's okay. Within the military industrial complex, that's fine. B 2 first flight was July 17, 1989. New York Times, they reported July 18, 1989. But we already stated that the Westchester sightings were 83, 84. This didn't fly till 89. So it can't just be the standard B 2. We've got to be talking about something else. Could it be an early model? Could it be a hybrid, an advanced version? That's something we should consider. B-2 stealth bomber plant, they are originally assembled in subcomponents at Pico Rivera, California. Those subcomponents are eventually then shipped over to Northrop Air Force Plant 42 Palmdale, where the sub-assemblies are put together in the form of the B-2 stealth bomber. That's what you see here. Now, if you look at this, you've got one, two, three, four, right there. Four B-2 stealth bombers at the cost of $2.3 billion. You're looking, ladies and gentlemen, at $10 billion right there. $10 billion just right there alone. Some of that funding could have gone off to something else. 132 bombers were proposed in the early part of the design. 79E, 132 were proposed. Only 21 were built. And so if we've already sunk in 22.4 and they only built 21, you can see the lower number of aircraft built, the higher the cost, right? That's where we get these tremendous numbers for the B-2. Look at how the cost just kept getting higher. In 1989, it was $274 million per aircraft, right? 530 by 1990. By 1991, it skyrocketed to $864 million, 2.3 at the end of production run, $2.3 billion just for one aircraft. So they asked the question in Newsweek, an $80 billion bust? I mean, what's going on with these tremendous costs associated with this? Even Time Magazine had to raise a red flag. And they stated here, House Armed Service Committee Chairman Les Aspen estimated that the eventual cost of the stealth bomber will be $1.058 billion per aircraft. At that price, the 70-ton B-2 weighing the equivalent of 2 million troy ounces would be more than its own weight in gold, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're talking about here. Tremendous amount of spending. Is there something else going on with the B-2, and I'm just proposing this, that we don't know about? Is there something else going on here? Aviation Week Space Technology, March 9, 1992, asked the same question. Black world engineer scientists encourage using highly classified technology for civilian applications. In this article, they talk about some classified technology going on within the B-2 program. They state that the uh, B-2 electrically charges the leading edge of the wing to reduce the radar cross signature, but then also negatively charges the exhaust gases to reduce the infrared signature. Now, any students of this line of research will immediately indicate and find out and will recognize that this is the exact same technology that T. Townsend Brown was proposing 
in the 1930s talking about an electrogravitic propulsion system. So there's a historical legacy of this type of technology, no question. For, uh, this is from Electrogravitic Systems by Thomas Vallone, reports of a new propulsion methodology. So in this article, in this book, they talk about this perhaps hybrid propulsion system and the electric charging of the wings. And this I got from a General Dynamics Northrop engineer, and he stated, for every three B2s that are built, one quote-unquote anti-gravity is also built. Since we have 21 B2s, that would mean seven secret versions have been constructed. Now, according to his testimony, we have another B2, a secret early B2 that isn't acknowledged to the public, that is larger than the standard B2, and has a different trailing edge section that we see here. So something, at the very least, is going on with the B2 that we don't know about. Then I ran across this article. Northrop accused of B2 mischarges of over 20 billion. The lawsuit exposes a pattern of methodology of fraud that has permeated the entire B2 program. The program was like some tapeworm that insinuated itself into the gastrointestinal system of the taxpayers. So we're paying for this, ladies and gentlemen. This is our aircraft. We have a right to know where our tax dollars are going. And then I got this report from Aviation Week Space Technology senior editor Bill Scott, who's the mountain, Rocky Mountain editor. He's retired now, but he told me that there was a UPS driver, this is Highway 375, heading northbound near Groom Lake, and in 1984, a boomerang-shaped craft with a triangle trailing edge was facing him in the operate, uh, opposite direction as this plane flew directly over his UPS truck at very low altitude. The compression wave pushed his UPS truck down, and all this <coughs> dust started coming up from around the craft, and then this thing went into a vertical and peeled off to the left. He got out of his truck and was just able to see the trailing edge of this craft. So what he stated was, quote, it looked like the B-2, but wasn't the B-2. So there, it's very clear that something else is going on within those very early years of B-2 development. Now, we want to talk about what could be the Rosetta Stone to a lot of the aircraft that we've seen since the 82, 89 wave and beyond. <coughs> We're talking about the Reagan military buildup, 81 to 89. What are the things that we heard during the Reagan administration? We heard these terms, nuclear war with Russia, the evil empire. We heard this, the term first strike was pounded into us again and again. We heard this concept, early warning, mutually assured destruction, strategic defense initiative. This is a tapestry that was woven throughout the 1980s during the Reagan administration. We heard these terms over and over again. So I asked the question, are we dealing with a semi-rigid, neutral buoyancy, lighter-than-air vehicle? Could that be one of the aircraft associated with the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings? If you look at this AIAA document, that stands for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and look at the time frame, 1979, 80, 81, 82. This is August 20th, 22nd, 1979. Uh, this is another one here. Current LTA, lighter than air vehicle technology. This is from the conference, 1981, May 12th to 14th. Now look at what they have. They've got lenticular rigid. They've got deltoid rigid. They've got heavy lift non-rigid. So the technology, the feasibility for these craft already existed in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Could they have done something with the $20 million that we talked about, siphoned off from the 2.3 billion and eventually the 22.4 billion? Absolutely. High altitude powered platform, a microwave powered airship, AIAA document 79-106. They talk about something that can go 20 kilometers high, that's powered by microwave energy. It has its own power source coming from the microwave uh, transmitting antenna and has a receiving antenna here. Could they have done something that looks triangular, that looks boomerang with this technology? It's certainly a possibility. Uh, they also talk about a relocatable over-the-horizon radar system, which is a powerful shortwave signal from a large transmitting antenna reaches a target beyond the horizon by reflecting off the ionosphere and the echo signal 
from the target returns to the receiving antenna by the same radio route. So what they're doing is they're projecting a high frequency radio frequency signal up onto the ionosphere. They're bouncing it down and then that frequency is reflected back to the receiving antenna. This is a relocatable over the horizon radar that was developed by the Navy in 1965. Does this play a role in the Reagan administration? That's what we want to explore very briefly here. Now take a look at what we've got. This is the receiving antenna for a relocatable over the horizon radar. I know we've got the, the mic here. You might have to check that. Check, check. From a 27 clear for launch. Okay, so if you take a look at this relocatable over the horizon radar, this is the receiving antenna up on the upper left. If you look at here at the upper right and on the bottom here, what do you see, ladies and gentlemen? I ask this question to you. What do you see? We're looking at cross beams. We're looking at tubes, pipes, cylinders. We're looking at girder construction like a truss bridge. This is exactly what the eyewitnesses of the Hudson Valley boomerang are, are reporting. The exact same structure is seen in these over-the-horizon radar, almost a dead ringer. So what I am proposing, and this is just my assessment, it could be correct, maybe it's way off, but this is a possibility that we have to explore because we have to look at all things and be completely non-biased and neutral when we look at the Hudson Valley sightings. I'm proposing that what we're looking at in some of the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings is nothing more than a mobile airborne over the horizon radar system operated by the US Navy. That's what I'm proposing on some of the sightings because it answers almost all the questions. It's silent, it hovers, it has the cross beam and curter construction, it has the transparent panels on the bottom, it can make 180 degree flat turns make with all the lights embedded in concrete. And it's mobile, that's the key to it. It's a mobile system. Now, this is something that, that I put together with the help of uh, Tom Bogan. And we're just stating that this is what it might look like if you peel back those composite panels showing the interior. We could be looking at that electrogravitic propulsion system that I showed you on that Aviation, Aviation Week article using electrogravitics and a hybrid superconductor with a toroid in the center. Here you would have the liquid nitrogen tanks that feed through the pipes going into the toroid. That might explain the tubes that were seen by the eyewitnesses and the low frequency electrical humming noise would be the transformer. I've blown up this section here. This is the section where you have the transformer. These are the pipes leading to the central toroid. And then here we've added in a naval officer peeling back the skin. And then this is the control room here. This is the map room here. We've got different things here. But of course, this could be an unmanned vehicle. This would be the manned version. Usually when they have a classified test flight, they usually have a manned version first, and then they come out with an unmanned version second. Again, here's some of the liquid nitrogen cooling tanks, and then this is the uh, electrical transformer in this location. But again, you wouldn't see any of this with the composite panels in place, but I've pulled them off for this presentation. Again, here's the control room here in this location. Now this answers almost all of the questions. These, these huge colored I-beams that we're seeing, it's answered by this configuration. We also have these probes that would come down over lakes and waters and rivers. That's answered by this configuration. Here you can see the additional pipes here for liquid nitrogen cooling. We've heard of this. Now, what would they be doing with an airborne mobile over the horizon radar system during the Reagan administration buildup? They would be tracking Russian mobile missile launchers. They'd be looking at Russian ICBM silos, Russian nuclear submarine bases. Now, why is this important? Because in the standard relocatable over the horizon radar system, it is not impervious to Soviet missile attack. But in this system, you could fly it anywhere. It's impervious to uh, attack by Russian ICBM. So you can see why this would be advantageous to build within the Reagan administration. Hudson Valley scorecard. This is something I put together just to do a side-by-side -side comparison. So on the left, we've got the Hudson Valley UFO sightings. On the right, we've got the Reagan buildup. So Hudson Valley sightings, 82 to 89. Reagan buildup, 81 to 89. That's a match, right? March 24th, 1983, Taconic State sighting. Reagan buildup, March 23rd, 1983, SDI. That matches. 
82, 89 was the sightings. B2 development, October 81 to November 88, that matches. The Hudson Valley sightings were primarily on the East Coast. The U.S. Navy's developed the relocatable over-horizon radar on the East Coast. The sightings were uh, during Thursday nights primarily. Test flights of classified aircraft are tested on Thursday nights. The wave tapered off 89. Reagan administration ended in 1989. That's a ringer. Radio static recorded by eyewitnesses. Electromagnetic disturbances in the vicinity of a relocatable over-horizon <coughs> radar would cause the exact same electromagnetic disturbances as reported by the eyewitnesses. Liquid nitrogen cooling pipes for the UFO Hudson Valley. Composite uh, superconductor breakthrough in 1986. That's a, a very close match. Carbon fiber construction. Anyone will tell you that the composite aircraft construction made its breakthrough in the early 1980s. Uh, why was the Hudson Valley boomerang not seen over downtown New York City? You would think the first thing that the Hudson Valley boomerang would do, if it was perhaps an extraterrestrial spacecraft, they would park that thing right over Tom's Times Square, would look at all the lights, right? The Hudson Valley boomerang was never reported over downtown New York City. That's a question we should ask. Did they have a risk of a blackout? And then no U.S. Air Force fighters were scrambled after the Hudson Valley boomerang, 81 to 89. Is that because they already knew what it was and they were told to stand down? So after looking at the evidence very clearly, I think it's, it's, it's acknowledged that we should uh, look at three significant points on the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings between 82 and 89. Number one, ultralights were not involved in any capacity, period, right off the bat. Number two, planes were involved, but they didn't explain all the sightings of the Hudson Valley boomerang. Number three, the technology involved in the actual, perhaps early B-2, and then the relocatable over the horizon radar, that technology needs to be declassified and handed in to the scientific community. Absolutely, that needs to be done. I also have a flyer for everyone when you leave here tonight, but I want to talk about just quickly the funding for what we could be talking about here. This is the Reagan buildup, Detroit Free Press, February 8, 1987. Secret ledger hides military projects. Pentagon black budget has tripled under the Reagan administration. So ladies and gentlemen, if you look here, this is growth by spending fiscal year 1988. In the beginning of the Reagan administration, the black budget rose by just over half a billion. By the end of the Reagan administration, it rose by 9.122 billion. Here's federal spending by category. We've got agriculture, 26 billion. Transportation, 28 billion. The Pentagon's black budget was 35 billion. We're spending more on classified black budget programs than we are on education, on agriculture. Total procurement funding for the Air Force fiscal year 1988 was 51 billion. All of that 19.1 billion was the classified programs. So could the Navy, could the Air Force have siphoned off some of that 51 billion into a classified program that we don't know about? Eight years of the Reagan administration were very good to the black world. No question about it. They have developed planes that mimic the form, fit, and function of what people might be seeing as UFOs. But in point of fact, some of them may be our own deep black programs. And I really do want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.